Colleagues, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Louise Morpeth. Louise is co-director of Dartington Social Research Centre, and she has been leading the consortium development here in Scotland since the very start, working for the very first partner, which was Renfrewshire Council and Renfrewshire CPP. She has been leading some groundbreaking work with Birmingham City Council in terms of shifting £42 million pounds of spend and she's been leading more recent developments in terms of the big lottery work down um, south. So she is going to provide an overview of the work of the five sites that make up the consortium. Louise. Thank you. Um, it's fabulous to be here. Um, it's lovely to be back in Perth. Before I start, I'd really like to know um, who's in the room. We've been working over the last five years with five authorities, Perth and Kinross, Renfrewshire, North Ayrshire, Angus and Dundee. If you're from one of those five authorities, could you raise your hand? Okay, so could you put your hand down? So those of you who didn't raise your hand, could you now raise your hand? Okay, so we've probably got about a one-third, two-third mix. So those of you who are from the five authorities will have some experience or have had some involvement in what I'm about to talk about. And those others who've come, I guess you want to hear what we've learnt. So um, instead of printing off PowerPoint slides, we've written a, a little booklet. So what I'm going to talk about is all written in the booklet that you've been given. So you can either have a 20-minute snooze, and you can put your pen down. You don't need to take any notes. So there won't be any PowerPoint slides to go with this. Um, as I said, we've, we've had the great privilege of working in, in Scotland now for five or six years. In fact, I had a conversation with Peter MacLeod more years ago than I can care to recall, and I would never have predicted that I would have ended up alongside um, the Deputy First Minister of Scotland talking about data to you. So it is a terrific opportunity to be here. So, a few acknowledgements first of all. Um, we haven't done this work alone. Five areas have put money in to a programme of work to use data to drive change in children's services. A couple of others I'd like to acknowledge. Um, many of you won't have heard of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. It's an American foundation, one of the biggest foundations that supports work for vulnerable children. And it was an investment by them that was stimulated by a frustration on their part that public services in the US were simply not taking advantage of evidence and using evidence to inform children's services. So they made a big investment that we were able to benefit from because we contributed to it. And Perth and Kinross actually was a pilot site for a piece of work that was sponsored by um, the Annie E. Casey Foundation and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Scottish Government have been supportive throughout. They've enabled um, three of the authorities here to participate in this work, and they've also supported this conference today and some other events that have gone on over the past few months. So thank you to the supporters. So some of you might have heard of the Dartington Social Research Unit. We are an independent charity. We're passionate about improving children's lives, and we see that evidence, science, and data has an important role to play but that only works if it's put into the hands of people like you so that you can use it to inform the decisions that you make. Our head office is down in Dartington in Devon. We have a little office up in Glasgow um, located with the Robertson Trust. Okay, so this is all written in your hands, handouts. Our interest at Dartington is seeing if it's possible to achieve impact at scale in communities, to improve the well-being of children in a measurable fashion and we think there are four things that can contribute to that. First, really good quality data. And we're going to showcase a little bit of what we've found from the five sites around the data. Second, understanding how the money is spent. It's a bit like the elephant in the room, isn't it? We know we're going to have less money. We have to think really, really smartly about how we're going to use that money in future to the benefit of children. Third, we work with sites to um, build capacity, to provide training, to provide facilitation, to develop strategies that are about improving outcomes, about implementing those strategies and monitoring those strategies to see if we're actually making the difference that we expect. And fourth, accountability, looking at governance arrangements that actually allow public systems to sit alongside community members to take shared accountability for what we're achieving for children. 
So what I'm going to share with you in the following slide is not a great kind of puff piece about all things that we've done wonderfully well. This is a warts and all account of what we've done. We've done some things that I think have been phenomenal and some things just haven't worked. And the spirit of today is to try to be open so that we can learn. We don't just pat ourselves on the back, that we actually share in the spirit of collaboration what we've learned so that other sites can benefit from that insight. So the first thing we've learned is that it is possible to gather incredibly high quality data about the well-being of children in an affordable and quick fashion. Um, I'm going to in a moment show you a, a web portal which will allow you to have a look at the data that's been collected across the five sites over the last few years. But just to give you a taster, we have got data from 46,000 children in Scotland. We have had 3,000 parents participate in surveys to give us a picture of the well-being of children aged 0 to 8. We have a remarkable data set in Scotland, probably unparalleled, to be honest. I don't know anywhere else in the world that has data like you have in Scotland. And it can be done quickly and affordably. Just to give you a taster, I hope you can see that. These are the five sites. Um, to highlight, let's look at Perth and Kinross. So at the top there, there are 24,000 children in Perth and Kinross. Over 8,000 of those young people participated in a well-being survey. And we had over 800 parents participate in a survey on the well-being of children 0 to 8. And you can see around the slide there the numbers of children that have participated in the well-being surveys across the five sites. Lots has come out of that. I'm not going to bore you with bar charts and statistics, but I do want to pull out a couple of things that have been striking across the five sites. For the first, we look to see how much need there is in the community. The red circle there represents the proportion of children in the community who would have needs that if they came to your door, you would probably think you should do something to help them. Typically, one in five children are in that red circle. Second, we're able to know how many of those children are actually in contact with services. And you can see from the circle there that about 12% of children are in contact with either social care or specialist educational services. But you can see that the overlap is not perfect, and the red circle is much larger than the service circle. So we know that the majority of children who have needs are not in contact with specialist services, and we know that there are children who have, um, are in receipt of services who do not have high levels of need. And this has been a pattern that has come out across the five sites that we've worked. This is not unique to Perth and Kinross or to North Ayrshire. Um, if, you are a if you love data and you want to dig into the data, there is a portal. Those of you who are going to the data workshop, you can have two hours of data. Um, but my colleague Luke is in the room over there and he's just going to show you the website. We, um, we're working on this till about two o'clock this morning, so I hope it's um, going to work. <laughs> So, Luke, over to you. So, this is the portal for the, five, the data from the five sites. And um, you can, it's, it's been designed to be interactive so that if you're not into data, you can play around with the portal and um, learn about what's been going on. OK, Luke? Great. So, you've seen the circles. You can um, build this picture up. You can see what the factors are that meant that children ended up in the red circle. You can see the overlap, but you can also see for each of the five sites what those circles look like. So you can click on, what have we got there? I think that's um, Dundee. You can see what those percentages are for Dundee. Click on it for North Ayrshire and see what those percentages are for North Ayrshire. If you hovered over the red circle, you'd be able to see the percentages of the children who participated in the survey for all those different things, like their use of substances, their uh, contact with antisocial peers, their experience of poor family management. Where am I going next, Luke? I just felt like doing this blind. OK, next, the data. Um, we've tried to be creative in how this data, you can interact with this data. So we have this beautiful thing called a spirograph that allows you to look for an individual area, all the different risk factors. And all the lines that are connecting them are just showing how different risk factors are associated with each other. The sizes of the circles indicate how prevalent that risk factor was in that community. And you can do all sorts of things like comparing um, one authority with another. You can see, oh, here we go. You can uh, have a look at the incidents in one authority, and you can then compare one area with another. 
possible with more than one, or with all five. And the last um, piece of the website to show you is, um, at the moment, we've just got Perth and Kinross's data. I hope we'll be able to add the data from the others. But one of the wonderful things about the survey is that we can disaggregate it down to the level of schools or communities. And so here we have um, one of the schools, one of the risk factors, and that's the prevalence. So if someone wants to really dig in and understand the profile of need in a particular school or a particular area, that data is there. Lovely. Thank you. OK, can I move back to the slides, please? I've gone through that quickly because data doesn't flick everybody's switch. The portal is there. If you've got your laptop or your, a tablet with you, you can have a look at it. I just want to move on because I'm conscious of my time. Am I right for time? OK. So we can do fantastic things with data. We can make it interactive. In fact, you can get lost in the data. You can ask lots of questions and get answers from the data. But really, it's important to remember that data is a means to an end. If we don't use that data to change what we do, then we actually haven't done good service to those 46,000 children that have participated in the surveys and given us this rich insight. In fact, I wonder whether sometimes being able to allow people to interact so intensively with the data may slow down our ability to make decisions. So as a researcher, it's a question I have in my mind. At what point do we say, actually, we know enough now. We've now got to make some decisions. We've got to do something different. Enough data, time to actually do something with it. One of the other things we've done in the five areas is something called fund mapping. And this is to understand how you currently spend your money. I would be the first to say it's pretty quick and dirty, but it's trying to get that big picture of what you spend in education, in social care, in mental health, in other areas, to the benefit of children. Typically, we find about £5,000 per child, on average, is spent, which means that you're investing in Scotland over £5 billion a year in children. And I guess in a time when budgets are contracting, we have to ask, are we getting the most for children out of that £5 billion? We found, when we've tried to do an analysis, that a relatively small percentage is actually dedicated to early intervention, about 3%. And that's a pattern that we've seen across the five sites. And I hate to state the obvious, but services are very, very, very reluctant to be decommissioned. And when there's no new money, the only place money comes from to do new things is by stopping doing something you do already. And in every place we've worked, not just in Scotland, in England, in the US, Services resist being decommissioned. And that's the challenge that we face as we're trying to work out how to better use our money to the benefit of children. OK. Um, uh, John Swinney talked about using evidence-based approaches, as did Bernadette. And at Dartington, we've probably been championing that cause for more years than I care to remember. Um, and it's definitely the case that they're not widely used in children's services. When we do the fund mapping, we struggle to find more than half of 1% of total expenditure spent on top-tier evidence-based programs. So clearly there is an opportunity to do more in that regard. However, if you do spend money on evidence-based programs, it does matter that you offer them to the right people. I have encountered many places where some money's been spent perhaps on a program like Incredible Years. I think we have representatives from Incredible Years here. That program's fantastic at improving the behavior of children um, who have a behavioral difficulty. It gives parents strategies to manage behavior. But if you offer that program to parents who are actually doing just fine, I'm sure they'll have a great experience, but you won't get the impact you're looking for. Those interventions need to be offered to the people who can most benefit. And also a point made by um, John Swinney was around value for money. We do have better understanding now, not only of what works, but whether something is good value. And I think increasingly we're going to have to become better at that as money, um, as budgets contract. And the final point on here, it's all very well putting some money into evidence-based programs. It's all very well targeting the right people. But more often than not, these are done on the periphery of services. These are done as projects, small investments for small teams. If we're going to make the differences we aspire to, these things need to be done at scale. 
and they need to be planned almost like a military operation over several years with real thought and attention given to implementation, not just to choosing a programme, not just to funding a programme, but to actually how it gets implemented at scale. A couple more observations before I wrap up. Obviously, evidence-based programmes are great. I'm a researcher, I would say that, but they are not the panacea. There are opportunities with evidence-based practices, evidence-based policies, evidence-based processes, and increasingly, using what we're learning from science to innovate, have science-based innovations. So this isn't saying we should spend all of our money on evidence-based programmes. There's a lot more that we could do, and there's innovation that we could be investing in. Final point, I know there's an interest in trying to use philanthropic money to sort of cat be a catalyst for change in public services. And I think there's a really important role. But I think we also have to be aware that when you're spending five billion, the amount of money that's available from philanthropy pales into insignificance. So we should be looking to philanthropy and funds like that as one strategy for perhaps changing what we do. But most of the action is in the money that you have at the moment and changing how that is spent. So let's balance the opportunities philanthropy might, might be able to provide with what needs to happen with the current money that you have. So three closing thoughts. These are my personal, or Dartington's personal reflections, so we take responsibility for these. So I hope the sites will have a robust response to what we're saying. I think the first is, you have unparalleled data in Scotland on the well-being of your children. It is remarkable. I've not seen anything else like it. You have the opportunity to build on that and do that for other authorities or even for your country. Second, something that we pushed very hard, particularly with Bernadette and colleagues, was been able to allow community members to come round the table to share accountability for outcomes. We have got a long way to go on that point. We're sharing data, which is a first step in becoming more accountable, but actually being able to make those decisions together around the table, I think we really need to be innovative and bold in that regard. And on the third, around evidence-based programs, we can do so much more. Um, not just around programs, but around policies, practices, processes, and some good quality innovation. Thank you.